Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Rob Brown, and I'm a Senior Strategy Analyst with the Global Automotive Group at Novellus Incorporated. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about this concept called value of information when making risk-based decisions. Um, and I've put together this material this morning, hopefully to address maybe some of you, or hopefully most of you, in fact, that are just beginning to learn about concepts of decision and risk analysis and how you can use these to inform better decision making in your own organizations and possibly even um, by yourself um, you know as a is just a singular decision maker but um, the, the key idea behind this concept of value of information is to address the question of how much are you willing to pay to actually know before you make a decision which pathway or which decision course of action you should take uh, in an imminent decision situation. So one of the things that we learned very early on in this concept of decision and risk analysis is the idea that just because you make a good decision, that doesn't necessarily mean that you will experience an outcome that is preferable to you. And one of the ways that I like to actually demonstrate this idea is with a sort of a, a coin toss type arrangement, um, although I use a, a tack. Uh, and this is actually a very common sort of demonstration that practitioners in the decision analysis uh, field use because it's really nice to demonstrate something that doesn't have an obvious set of probabilities associated with outcomes. So we use a tack because a tack does produce two known sets of outcomes, but we have to think a little bit in order to come up with what we would call our probability or degree of belief about those various outcomes. So um, the way I'd like to set this up though and sort of set the situation up that leads us into this question about value of information is that consider the situation where you've sort of won an opportunity to take another gamble. And this gamble has a future payoff, but it only pays off when you make a correct call on the outcome of a tossed tack, much the way you would call a coin before, uh, let's say, a, uh, a football game, uh, the way we do here in the US. Um, so after the, the toss of the tack, uh, or even before the toss of the tack, uh, you are asked to call whether the tack will point up or point down. And if, of course, the tack points up, you'll win $100. You, you'll win the payoff uh, when you call it up. And then when you call it uh, down, uh, you will uh, win the outcome of $100 as well. I see that my screen is not actually representing this uh, conditionality quite right. Um, but anyway, the, the idea is that if you make the correct call, you win $100. If you fail to make the correct call, you don't win anything. So before you sit down into this situation and you've assessed the, the probabilities associated with the tack occurring either up or down, and you've assigned those probabilities in your mind as 60% down and 40% up, you think about the outcomes that can occur, right? So if we look at our decision tree, um, if we look at the lower set of branches, uh, on the lower set, we could call down before we know the actual outcome. And in that case, we would win $100. And in the upper uh, uh, branch of the decision tree, we also see a very similar situation, but in this particular case, our winnings would only be, on the average, $40. So wanting to be rational, with our decision making, we choose the pathway that maximizes our expected or our average value of looking at, you know, all the, the possible futures that could occur. But even if you choose, and this is the key point behind the idea that just because you've chosen well doesn't necessarily mean that you win the or experience an outcome that you desire. Even when you choose that branch uh, that it maximizes your expected value, you could still face a situation which you call down and an up situation occurs. The same occurs for the other branch as well. If you decided 
to go ahead and call up, even though our analysis indicated that we should choose down, uh, you could call up, but there would still be a probability that, or a possibility, a very significant possibility that the down experience could occur. So the question then becomes, as we face this situation, since we could make a rational or a good decision, but not necessarily experience the outcome we desire, how much should we be willing to pay in order to know for certain that we could get that outcome that we desire before we make the call? So one of the tools that we use uh, to address this concept is the idea of engaging with a clairvoyant, a benevolent clairvoyant who has omniscience. And this clairvoyant uh, can tell you everything about the future, but she will only tell you for a price. And so the question now is, given that your potential earnings are $100 on a correct call, how much are you willing to pay to have certain information before you make the call? Well, we don't necessarily have uh, a clairvoyant available to us, but we can sort of think about this problem from the point of view of having that clairvoyant. And we can do that by actually reversing our decision tree that we just discussed. So the way we would do this, if you'll notice on the right-hand side of the screen, this is the original uh, decision tree that we had. I've redrawn this so that the uncertainty, that is the, the toss of the tack, occurs first. So I've drawn it over here. And then on the branch of each of those outcomes, we then make the call. Now notice that um, what we're essentially indicating with this arrangement is that we know the outcome with certainty, and then on the outcome of that uh, event, we then make the call. So the way we figure this now is we calculate the expected value of the, uh, not really, I'm sorry, the decision, the expected value, but the decision value on this node, which is we call 100 when we know that it's up and we automatically win $100. But in the real world, this would only occur 140 times on average against a large number of tosses. Um, and on this branch, we would call down when we know that the branch is down, when the tack falls down, and we would win uh, $60 uh, against maybe about 100 tosses. And then the expected value of those two is essentially $100. So knowing beforehand is worth $100 by itself. And so now this also raises an interesting question for us. Why should we not be willing just to pay up to $100 to know the outcome? Because we're going to win $100. But we forget oftentimes that the actual decision-making process itself before we have this perfect information is going to reveal an answer to us sort of in an expected basis anyway. So just by following the rational uh, pathway that we would follow normally on this side, nature would reveal to us $60 worth of value to begin with. So we're essentially looking at the premium that we'd be willing to pay uh, to have this additional information over and above the information that we currently have about the possible outcomes and their probabilities. So the difference between that original $60 that we could potentially win by calling uh, the outcome correctly, less the, or taken from the $100 of knowing with certainty, gives us an expected value of $40. This is the premium value, again, of knowing beforehand what will occur. So what this represents is not a commitment to additional expenditure. So we don't have to spend the $40. It gives us a budget to think about. As we interact with our clairvoyant, we can use that $40 as a way of saying, this is the most that we'd be willing to negotiate to get this information. But we have all of that space between zero and $40 to negotiate uh, input from our clairvoyant. So this becomes a really very valuable tool uh, in a more generic uh, application, if you will, more toward business case applications as opposed to just sort of simple parlor tricks, the one like I'm showing us here. Um, and we'll see how this works out as we move forward. But let me just, you know, propose that 
this kind of sets up the idea that before we go down a pathway of executing a particular strategy in business, um, that there are oftentimes uncertainties that present themselves that may warrant doing further research around that uncertainty. So for example, it may represent additional design of experiments that we could perform, which have a cost, or uh, maybe they represent a market study that could be performed on one of the variables. Um, and so we would be able to know beforehand what our rational upper bound on a budget we should be willing to discuss with somebody that would provide those services or those activities for us that would give us better information. Also, as I move forward a little bit, I'm gonna kind of point out that from a um, maybe an introductory perspective, I'm discussing this in terms of having perfect information, which as you probably would already guess, we very rarely have perfect information about anything that we deal with um, in business decision-making or any other realm of our lives um, until it's potentially too late. Um, so we frequently also talk about the value of imperfect information. I'm not really gonna discuss imperfect information today uh, because just even by knowing the perfect information uh, value, we know our upper bound. So we know that we're going to be somewhere between zero dollars and this upper bound of value that we could potentially spend to get better insight about uh, an outcome uh, of, a, of a variable that's important for us to know about before we commit to a decision making. One of the, I think, good examples of where this uh, can be applied is the, the frequently cited um, Freemark Abbey Winery case study. Um, this was first presented in, um, I think, Harvard Business School. So if you actually wanna read the case study, I would uh, recommend that you do a Google search on Freemark Abbey Winery. Um, and you can download uh, probably some, uh, you know, a, a, a file of this uh, on the web. Um, usually, I think the probably the most appropriate way would be to acquire this from Harvard Business School themselves. Um, but the question that we would like to address here with this particular uh, case study um, or is it, sort of twofold. Number one, we present something that's a slightly more complex example. Uh, but then we also might find out that this value of information maybe isn't always a, a positive value. But let's, before we get there to that final conclusion, uh, let's explore what went on with the free market Abbey Winery. So uh, the story goes that in uh, the early fall of 1976, there was a storm that approached uh, the Napa Valley just before harvest. It was about a week before harvest. And this presents a, a conundrum to the uh, to the winery owners because if it rains, that additional water on the grapes can ruin their crop or, or make it almost ruined. And we'll explore how that can be the case in just a second here. But um, there's another, uh, I guess, benefit that may occur. And I'm going to discuss that here in just a second. But here, a week before harvest, and given the idea or the notion that this storm is developing and approaching, uh, the owner or one of the partners of the winery, William Yeager, assessed that the probability of rain within the valley on his winery was around 50%. And so, um, he had to start thinking about whether or not he should harvest his grapes now. Now, as I mentioned, there is a benefit to having the rain that could occur at this particular time of year. And that is, is that there is a particular mold called Botrytis cinerea that can attack the grapes. And the effect of them attacking the grapes is that sometimes um, when they do attack, uh, they can leave behind uh, an extraordinarily wonderful wine. Um, it's called botrytized. Uh, Riesling, which is the particular type of wine that um, the folks here at uh, Fremark Abbey were producing. Um, and at this period of time, as it still is, um, the wine that is botrytized 
uh, is considered at a premium value over normal Riesling wine. And in this, uh, this particular time in history, uh, people were paying about 2.8 times the price of a normal Riesling. So if it rains, uh, Mr. Yeager again assessed the probability of the mold forming at about 40%. And so the question that he now has to ask himself and uh, commit to something very quickly is how much would he be willing or how, or would he be willing to harvest uh, the grapes now, or should he wait to see if the um, Botrytis scenario actually forms on the grapes? So of course this situation is probably a little bit more complex than just the way uh, I presented it. So let's think about all the various possibilities that can occur uh, as the decision to either wait or harvest uh, material begins to materialize. So the first is let's follow the lower branches. Um, if we go ahead and harvest now, or if Mr. Yeager goes ahead and, and harvest now, he can potentially uh, gain about $2.85 uh, on each bottle of wine, and they would be expected to produce about 12,000 bottles um, uh, in this particular harvest season. So the value of that would be about $34,000. On the other hand, if the winery decides to wait to see what will happen, and then they experience the fact that it doesn't rain, uh, there are three potential outcomes that can occur. So if it doesn't rain, uh, there is some possibility that the sugar content and the acid content will go below the level that actually creates a high quality Riesling that would, could be sold at 285, and instead they would only be able to get $2.50 a bottle for this particular wine. On the other hand, if there's about 20% sugar that's formed, we can start to get a little bit more premium value over our normal 285, and in this particular case, we could get $3 a bottle. On the other hand, if this sort of very rare condition or very fortunate condition, I should probably say, uh, occurs in which 25% sugar is formed in the grape, um, then um, we could get $3.50 a bottle. So this would be the case. These would be the three outcomes if it doesn't rain. And if we follow the normal practice of, of rolling back our decision tree, that is, we can multiply the 0.4 times each uh, or the probabilities of each event times their actual payoff values. Multiply those probabilities times their payoff values, sum them up, and that gives us our expected value for this particular branch, which is $37,000. Now, in the case that it rains, we could have a situation where the mold doesn't form at all. And if it does not form, then we are facing a situation where our grapes actually expand uh, with extra water, uh, and as a result of that, we could make about 5 to 10% more volume than we would normally have. So taking just the, the, the uh, arithmetic average between that 5 and 10%, making it 7.5%. 7.5% um, more than 12,000 bottles, but we would get a more of a wholesale price for those bottles at $2 a bottle. By the way, remember, these are like 1976 prices. We could forego the whole situation of trying to, um, you know, harvest the grapes at all. Just go ahead and adopt right up front that we're going to sort of try to minimize our losses altogether uh, and just sort of backstop those losses uh, and, and just sell the grapes direct. So if we do that, we could only get half the price of a normal, um, uh, of a normal shipment uh, at the uh, $25,000 level. Uh, in this particular case, we would only get half that value. And so um, we would then wind up only making about $12,000. Now, in this particular case, this is a decision that's made before we face any other uncertainties. And so we just merely take the maximum of these two. And so we would probably be better off in this particular case to go with just selling bulk wholesale wine. So that value becomes $25,800. Now, finally, if it rains and mold occurs, then we get this sweet, like I mentioned, sweet, luscious, complex wine, um, you know, that can be sold at a premium value of about 
uh, $8 a bottle. The little trade-off though that we experience is that we can only sell about 70% of the volume that we would have sold before. And so the net effect is that the payoff for waiting and seeing the mold form is that we would only make $67,000 uh, as opposed to the full $8 times 12,000 bottles. So again, rolling back our decision tree, we get the value of this particular branch is $42,000. Now, since the rain, the possibility of rain is 50% 50 50 in each case in our minds, um, we take the expected value of this and we see that the value to wait is $39,780. Since this now is a decision branch, in order to maximize our expected value or, uh, to ourselves, we would take the value that represents the largest branch or the largest valued branch and that would tell us that we should wait and that the expected value of waiting is that harvest decision. Um, I'm sorry, the, the harvest decision option that we would take is to wait and its value would be $39,000. Now, let me point out, this is the expected value. It is not necessarily the value that you get. So this relates, of course, to those words we use in decision analysis that don't necessarily have the plain meaning of use that we always, uh, that we hear in our, our typical everyday language. By expected value, I mean the probability weighted average of the future, uh, of all possibilities that can occur in the future uh, within the context of the decision that we're, we've framed. So it does not necessarily tell us this is what we will exactly experience. But it tells us, it gives us a way to weigh uh, in our minds, taking one pathway against another and then behaving in, a, in an informed or a rational manner against those outcomes. Now, here we sit one week before uh, the harvest and the uh, impending storm, and we have to ask ourselves, should we wait or do we go ahead and harvest? But given that the rain outcome is the one that sort of presents us with the most uncertainty uh, and might affect our overall value uh, the most because as you can see uh, harvesting now is worth thirty four thousand dollars but if it doesn't rain we would experience thirty seven thousand on average or forty two thousand so the rain seems to be the key uncertainty that we might want to know something about so then the question becomes should we pay some additional amount of money to know whether it will rain uh, with greater certainty uh, than just where we sit today. So very simply, we can rearrange our decision tree the way we did in the prior example, and we can put the knowing the weather outcome first, and then on each branch of that weather outcome, we then form the rest of the decision branches that can occur. And what we see is that when we take the lower uh, pathway, we get the $37,200 on the no rain situation. And then when we rerun the upper pathway, we get $42,360 on this particular branch of knowing you know, that it would rain. When we subtract now this value, uh, $39,780, which is our expected value on the backside of knowing that it, uh, of what the weather would be, and subtract from that our original value, we get zero dollars. And so this is really, uh, I think, a fascinating outcome because it tells us that regardless of knowing the rain outcome, it's still actually better just to go ahead and wait. So in this particular case, what we've learned is that it, we shouldn't pay any additional information. Right. And so this, I think, is probably non intuitive to most of us today, right? Because we are so awash and addicted to information that I think it's very easy to assume that the more information we have, the better, and that that information has always has value to us. And that is not always the case. So I think one of the other key ideas behind uh, this concept of value of information is that we need to learn how to drink information responsibly. We don't have to spend money on every, or spend resources on every opportunity to gain new information. Because I think what I've seen over my career, and I think this is probably true, is that we often feel 
that gain, gaining more information I and mean, paying for more information makes us feel good. It sort of helps us to absolve ourselves of, of saying, well, we didn't explore further. But gaining this information actually, in fact, may offer no additional effective decision guidance. And so therefore, the commitment to spending money to gain what we think would be better information is actually wasted resource and wasted money. So let's keep this in mind as well. Uh, the first concept being that having information, additional information over our current understanding of the problem may be helpful, but it is not always helpful. And we, we can use this concept of value of information to distinguish between those two states. All right. Um, what I'd like to do now is look at a more sophisticated example. So, so far, what we've been looking at is situations in which uh, we have discrete variables um, with discrete outcomes, but we very frequently don't experience those kinds of situations in real business uh, applications. The payoffs are not necessarily discrete and precisely known. The probabilities are themselves not necessarily discrete binary branches. Very frequently, we face situations in which the uncertainties are, can vary across a continuous domain, uh, and the payoffs themselves can vary quite uh, widely. So assessing the value of information in this particular ca uh, case um, is not as easy <clears throat> to do um, as it is in our sort of more uh, student level or you know, toy type cases. So um, what we need to do is come up with a situation where, or a, or a means rather, where we can assess this continuous nature of uncertainties uh, and do so in a tractable manner. And so what I've developed is a method to do that, um, and I'd like to discuss that here by showing you a very, again, another simple case, but, where, but it is more complex in the sense that we are using these continuous variables instead. So let's um, hypothesize a particular business situation in which we've identified four uh, key uncertainties <clears throat> that are important to us as we you know, begin to characterize the value of an investment opportunity. And this could be a new project, um, uh, it could be a strategic plan, um, but the, the four primary uncertainties are the amount of money that we would have to invest up front, which may not be known with certainty, um, then what the starting cash flow would be, what the mature cash flows might look like, and how long it would take us to go from that starting position to that mature position. Um, of course, again, this is highly simplified, uh, but with just the additional level of complexity that we are now dealing with um, continuous uncertainties as opposed to those that have known discrete possibilities. <clears throat> Pardon me for taking a sip of coffee here. Uh -huh. um, so if we look at the investments in this particular case, uh, they seem to be rather wide ranging, right? So in this particular uh, strategy A, you know, the very lowest end that we could conceive the outcome being would be somewhere around $400 million. But maybe it could be as high as $1.6 uh, million, dollars, or I'm sorry, billion dollars. Um, strategy B, on the other hand, is going to be located somewhere, or could potentially be located somewhere between 800 and a million and a billion. Uh, and C uh, is somewhere between 800 million and also $1.6 billion. The starting cash flow also will have a distribution to it as well. Uh, and you can see how we've conceived these, uh, how they might con uh, uh, present themselves uh, with our various strategies here. The mature cash flow also might have various range of uh, uh, distributions, as well as the time to the mature cash flow. And so all of these various considerations taken together uh, now present us with several different, you know, trade-offs to balance um, and before we commit ourselves to actually making a decision about which strategic pathway we might choose. So of course, we, we might have to look at well, what is our upfront investment levels? So each strategy has a different uh, level of investment, but they're close. 
uh, they're somewhat in the same neighborhood. Um, the amount of mature cash flow is different for each strategy. So specifically for the strategy C, while we might have to invest more upfront on average at $1.2 billion, the annual cash flow that it kicks off is higher than those other strategies we might consider. However, <clears throat> the recovery periods for those particular cash flows are different as well. So the, as we can see, the lowest investment uh, has in the end the lowest cash flow, although getting there is a little bit slower, um, or rather, I'm sorry, it is faster than the mid-level investment, which is, uh, I mean, our upper level investment, and then the uh, strategy A, which has the sort of the mid-level of investment uh, gets up to steady cash flow faster, but not quite as high as either, uh, not quite as high as C, but higher than B. <clears throat> when we look at the net present values of these, we are also seeing some things that we have to balance. So for example, uh, one of the very first things we might consider would be the average or the expected values of all of our cash flows. And we can see that strategy A uh, has a net present value of $227 million. Uh, B is next with 60 million and C is uh, falling behind at 24 million. And we can see why these values occur. It turns out that of course the, uh, or rather it turns out that A has this curve associated with it. Its probability of failure given the information that we are dealing with today is uh, about 15%. So you can see the inter intersection with the zero net present value. The probability of failure for strategy B is around 25%. And the probability of failure for C is somewhere around 45% by itself. Also, we are seeing that each one of these strategies have different levels of maximum exposure associated with them. And each one of them present themselves with various uh, levels of variation or variance across their potential outcomes. So we have quite a lot of uh, variables to consider here in order to think about making the right decision or the best decision given the information we have. And it is probably not going to be a surprise to you that we might want to know something about one of these variables, a little bit more about one of the variables that create these particular characteristics of our cash flows with a little bit more precision in such a way that we get a better set of precision uh, or, uh, on the strategy values themselves. So let me just kind of summarize what all this leads us to. And that is, is that if we were to approach this problem just with a simple deterministic um, or simply or more simple, maybe Monte Carlo type analysis, we are presented with a bit of a problem because our classical finance theory tells us that we should prefer strategies with the highest expected values, but with the least variance. And so if we go ahead and, and also those strategies that may, if we do go the route of taking a, a more of a Monte Carlo perspective as well, we want those strategies that are stochastically or strictly dominant over all the remaining alternatives. So if we just go ahead and let's say exclude C, at least for the moment from our consideration and leave ourselves with strategies A and B, um, we can see that strategy A, while it gives us the highest expected value, which we already know to be 227, and we can sort of visualize where that is probably close uh, with the median value indicator of our curve. Um, so A definitely has a higher expected value than B, but we can also see that A has less variance than, that, rather that B has less variance than strategy A. Um, and so, you know, frequently we're told that we should prefer those kinds of strategies that have less variance as well. So in this particular case though, we can't, uh, you know, have everything that we want in one particular strategy right off the bat. So we're left now with wanting to find some way to make further distinction between these two so that we can have a higher degree of confidence that we've chosen wisely. <clears throat> so um, maybe I should ask you, which strategy do you prefer? Or how would you think about this? Uh, how would you prioritize your search to improve the precision of the value measure that you have? 
Um, and then again, of course, uh, consistent with the nature of a discussion on value information, how much should you be willing to pay uh, to improve uh, that precision? Well, the way we can sort of begin to disaggregate this problem, particularly in cases where we have more than just four variables, is that we want to do, first of all, a kind of a sensitivity analysis that tells us how much the expected value of a particular strategy may be affected by variation, the independent variation contributed by one of our uncertainties. And so I've created the tornado diagrams or those uh, sensitivity charts for each of our strategies. And uh, if we look at these very closely, we can see that the investment uncertainty is the one that is probably the critical uncertainty between strategies A and B. And what that means is that if I were to take strategy A, which is the one indicated that maximizes my expected net present value, over B, the level of investment that could be required between the two is enough that it could cause me to, uh, to regret having taken A, that higher valued strategy, over B, if it had been the case that A's investment level way exceeded what B could have actually produced. Um, <clears throat> So that's going to be our first step is to take one of our criti uh, these critical uncertainties um, and do an examination of this value of information there. Now, let me say that, you know, having been involved in doing this kind of analysis over the years, um, very frequently the models that I generate with clients have oftentimes anywhere between 10 and 100 uncertainties in them. And it is pretty much always the case that I get these nicely formed tornado diagrams and out of all of the uncertainties there are only usually somewhere between four maybe at the most six but usually in that three to five range of uncertainties that really sort of move the needle the most on the net present value and of those four or five uh, it's usually just one or two that function as these critical uncertainties that is the uncertainty that presents to me the most likelihood of causing me to experience regret for having taken the best strategy over the next best strategy. So we're going to take the investment value and we're going to look at how we can actually calculate it's the value of information around that uncertainty, given the fact that it is both uh, continuous in nature as well as the payoff function is continuous in nature. So, let me just remind you again that the value of information, uh, we're going to describe that as the rational maximum budget that improves the quality of information we have in such a way that it reduces the overall ambiguity of the decision. That's a very high level sort of, let's say, meta statement. What that really boils down to is the value of knowing beforehand. It's the premium of knowing the value beforehand over the decision maximizing the expected value. And I've created a uh, in the end, what I, I hope to demonstrate, an Analytica model that helps me to calculate this because Analytica is the tool that I typically use the most in all of my decision analysis problems with clients. Um, but before I get there, let me discuss how to do this, um, let's say from a conceptual level first. So the first thing the, that I would ask you to consider is imagine that you can take the distributions associated with our critical uncertainty uh, for the investment levels. So this could be the distribution associated with the investment level for strategy B, and this could be the distribution associated with the investment level for strategy A. And I'm gonna walk across those investment levels and I'm gonna define, div, uh, divide them up into little bins. Uh, let's say, you know, for argument's sake, and as you'll see later on in my uh, Analytica de demonstration, that we use around 100 bins. So we divide up the overall domain of that uncertainty into 100 bins, and then we find the mid value of that bin, you know, for each bin. We do the same thing for both of these uncertainties. Now, we take each bin and we calculate the net present value of the overall decision as if that uncertainty has been set to only one of these bin values. So instead of using all of the samples from the distribution in the Monte Carlo, 
we're going to use only that one bin value, and we're going to use all 100 of those. And we're going to do the same thing with our other uncertainty. We're going to calculate those bin values, use them as the conditional starting points to calculate the net present value. And we're going to set up then a, uh, a matrix such that one layer of the matrix is all of the values of strategy A, and then the next layer are all of the conditional values of strategy B. Again, given that we've used in one of those bin values instead of the whole distribution for each uncertainty. So once we've set that up, the next thing that we would do is find the maximum value on each of those cells, those parallel cells to each other. So essentially what I'm performing would be a pairwise max value on each layer uh, within this gray matrix of the payoff values of my decisions. So this is basically equivalent to finding the maximum decision value for each branch on a decision tree with the uncertainties uh, set to the very beginning, right? So if you could imagine this, um, I'll sort of use my hands to demonstrate this. Let's let this hand represent each or represent a particular uncertainty. Um, each branch represents the bin values of that uncertainty. And then on each of these nodes, we also have another hand, set of hands, that represent the other investment level uncertainty. And uh, each finger represents, of course, those uh, mid values for each of the bins. So if I have my uncertainty divided up into 100 bins, hopefully to capture the overall as much as possible shape of that uncertainty, um, I would wind up having something like 10,000 branches uh, in a normal decision tree. So this is why we're using something more like a Monte Carlo and a matrix approach as opposed to trying to set this up into a decision tree. Because instead of a decision tree, we get something that's more like a decision bush. So once we know those, uh, the endpoints of all of those values across the decision bush, if you will, uh, and then we go back to the uh, the uncertainties themselves, the original investment uncertainty, and we find the frequency associated within the PDF or that probability distribution for that mid value. So for that frequency, it, and this frequency, for each of these uh, mid values, we then take the product of those two, and that gives us the conditional probability that that particular branch could occur within our normal decision tree. So now the, the net effect in this particular exercise or this operation would be that we have a whole matrix now, uh, uh, let's say about a, a 100 by 100 matrix of products of all of the frequencies associated with the mid values in each bin of our two investment levels, uh, investment level uncertainties. Now, finally, we take that product and we multiply the product times um, uh, the maximum pairwise value from the original operation and the net effect of that. And then we sum it over all those joint uh, probability bin frequencies with the pairwise max values. And the net effect is that we uh, now have uh, the situation where if we knew the outcome beforehand of those different investment situations and we chose our strategy on the basis of those outcomes, we would now have potentially available to us $250 million. So the difference between that situation of knowing the $250 million beforehand of knowing or having measured, I should say, the $227 million for our original strategy A, the difference is $23 million. And so what this tells us is that before we go down the pathway of developing strategy A versus strategy B, we have available to us a budget, a research budget of $23 million to know better what that actual investment value would have to be or would need to be in order to execute strategy A over strategy B. Um, so at this point, I should probably stop and ask if there are any questions about what I've covered so far. Um, I probably should have done that a little earlier for you, but um, feel free to uh, you know, post any questions you have at this moment. So I thought at this time, what I'll do is exit from the 
uh, PowerPoint presentation and show you an example, this example from Analytica and how it actually works out, uh, how these calculations actually work out. So this is the original um, model that I had developed in Analytica. It looks a little different uh, than the one I showed you in the presentation because I was playing around with some concepts last night. Um, but this is the original model. And so, you know, each, each uncertainty is actually represented with a set of probability distributions. In fact, what's going on underneath the, uh, these representations uh, in their idealized forms are about a thousand simulations for each one of those uncertainties. And they each vary continuously across this uh, investment level domain. Each one of these, just as I showed, uh, produce a set of cash flows, uh, as I demonstrated. And again, each one of these cash flows underneath uh, literally have uh, a thousand samples associated with each strategy across each year. And so ultimately what I'm doing is aggregating all these <clears throat> and their probability a weighted center of mass that we call the mean value, and we obtain these curves. Again, understanding that there are, a, for each strategy and for each year of our planning period, uh, are a thousand samples each varying continuously. So ultimately, we get the net present value that we looked at before. And we can see the trade-offs that we now face or the conundrum that we face because the outcomes don't necessarily match uh, our anticipation or the guidance that we are typically given in classical finance theory. And we might want to then calculate the sensitivity analysis on that. So for each strategy, we can now sort of see what the uh, impact of each uncertainty has on the expected value of the strategy measurement, strategy value measurement. Now, the VIU calculations uh, I've placed down in uh, this particular module, and I've written a way in which I can isolate each variable and then treat it in the manner that I demonstrated in the sort of conceptual description of calculating value of information with continuous variables. So what I've done is, first of all, I've said, I'm going to test the investment level. Can, uh, and I'm going to do that with strategies A and B. And so I'm going to assign what you see as UNC1 samples. Uh, these are the values associated with strategy A for the investment. And UNC2 samples are the investment levels for strategy B. And I'm going to hit this little button here to transform those values over here. And uh, to give you an idea of what this now looks like, I've taken those, un uh, those uncertainty values, uh, and you can see that I've retained all of their variation associated with each one. But I then created a new PDF associated with those uh, uncertainties or those uh, sample values. And I've divided them up uh, in such a way that I have about 101 um, or 102 bins uh, across uh, that distribution. And then I found the frequency that each bin occurs. Now, and I've done this in both situations for both the investment level for strategy A and the investment level for strategy B. Now I can calculate uh, the joint probability of both of these, and I'll do that by just simply multiplying those two distributions together, but relying on Analytica's underlying capability of treating um, these two uncertainties as orthogonal to each other, that is across each one being thought of as existing on an axis in that uh, square matrix that I showed you in the conceptual description of the value of information. And you can see now the effect. Uh, these are the bin values for strategy or the investment level for strategy B. 
this is, or I should say their index number. And this is the index number associated with the uh, bin values for investment level for strategy A that's on this particular column. And you can see the effect, uh, all 10,000 calculations, or a little bit more than 10,000, 102 by 102 uh, calculations. So that's my joint probability matrix. <clears throat> on this particular uncertainty, which I've also repeated over here as well, I'm going to apply the values that are that you we saw in this particular node, that is the values along this distribution in their uh, domain uh, of investment dollars, I'm going to take each one of those bin values and I'm going to hold our uncertainty fixed at each bin value. And then I'm going to recalculate the net present value for the strategy at each of those bin values. So the net effect is that you can see that the, the, the net present value, the expected net present value of uh, changes across my uh, values of each uns of the uncertainty. And I'm going to repeat that over this one as well. That same process. And then I'm going to compare both of these again as if they were orthogonal to each other because each one of them exists in a sort of a different domain from the other. And I'm going to basically set these up as, um, as you can see, so here we have the conditional net present values for um, this uh, strategy A on the investment level. And you'll notice that they're all repeated down the columns uh, for each value of investment level for strategy, the investment level for strategy two. And then if I switch over to strategy two, you can see that they are repeated across the rows. Those conditional values of net present value are repeated across the rows. So what I would like to do, let's, let's say for example, I pick this particular cell, three and two. If I switch back and forth, you can see that the, the outcome between those two is 199 or $200, $200 million versus $680 million. And so what I want to do is for that particular intersection point, I want to take the maximum value between the two of those. And the result would be that pair, uh, pairwise max array. And if I look at this graphically, what this looks like is that I now have a set of boundary situations in which I've always chosen the maximum net present value um, on the outcome of knowing the actual investment level associated with each uh, investment uh, opportunity. So now I take the probability, this joint probability calculation, I multiply that times this pairwise max so the, the pairwise max, I multiply by that joint probability, and then I sum it over all of the dimensions of the resulting dimensions, which would be the step indices for uh, investment level one and investment level two. The net effect of that is $249.7 million, or I have rounded it to 250 uh, in our presentation. So now all I have to do is simply find that prior decision value, uh, the expected value of that, which we already know to be 227 million, and the value of information is simply given as the difference between this value that we just calculated, that is the value of prior information, less the prior decision value that just simply maximizes our net present value uh, based on only our initial uh, information that we possess. The net effect, of course, is that for each or for that particular investment uncertainty, we should be willing to pay up to about $23 million to obtain better precision about what level of investment we may be facing. Of course, let me go back to our initial discussion on this. We are not required to spend $23 million to obtain this uh, additional information. This merely represents the upper bound on what we should be willing to pay. 
Uh, and so this gives us quite a bit of leeway. We can be very creative now. If we know that we have a budget of $23 million that we can rationally spend without destroying further value of our decision, um, we can take this and create a budget uh, to come up with some creative ways to get better refinement uh, on our investment, um, on, the, on the investment level that we may be facing. So this may be, again, a designed experiment. Uh, it may be uh, a more detailed engineering analysis. I mean, you can think of the many different possibilities that would give you a better understanding of the investment level. Uh, maybe, a, uh, maybe a very detailed market study. So let me go back to our presentation and just end it there and say uh, I really appreciate the time that um, uh, everybody uh, took to participate with this um, with me today. And uh, I hope this gave you some idea about how you could better spend your resources in order to make more informed decisions and not spend more money than you actually have to do so to get there. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Uh -huh.